<laughs> so, as you know, uh, I've been reading a lot of, of uh, the new right, uh, kind of what the new right is writing. Um, we know kind of the dominance of the left. You know how big of a critic I was of Donald Trump. Uh, and yet Donald Trump was, and to some extent, is still quite popular. Uh, and one of the things that is really striking, and I've talked about this before, and we'll probably be talking about this for years to come, is the fact that the popular ideas out there, the, 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 the anti-free market ideas, the anti, the anti-free market ideas are super popular out there. They're super popular out there, not just with the left. That's kind of obvious and that's expected and we all know that. But it's actually the case that the free market ideas are not popular with the right either. You see, they used to be, uh, I'd say until, until 2016, certainly, and, and uh, you know, going back to the 1950s, there was this coalition on the right. It, it was called diffusionism. It was conservatives uh, of different types fused together and or, or it didn't really fuse, but coalesce together, lobby together, uh, work together, basically uh, to defeat the left, uh, to defeat communism, to defeat the left and, and to, to, to bolster America. And, and even though they disagreed on certain elements, they agreed on enough that they could move the project forward. And, and really, I, 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 this is this is what um, Buckley uh, tried to do. And, and, and uh, it was a fusionism or an attempt to assemble, attempt to create a coalition around um, intellectuals and, and thinkers who are, pro, who are anti-communist, but might be fairly left on a lot of other things, very mixed economy, uh, fairly left on social issues, but very anti-communist, you know, and maybe very pro-American. The neocons were like this. Remember, the neocons, the neocons started out as uh, Trotskyites. They started out as communists. And then at some point, as Irving Kristol uh, used to say, Irving Kristol, the founder of the neocon movement, used to say they were mugged by reality. That is, they saw that leftism, communism, just didn't work. It was, it was it, it, impractical. It was not a good idea. And they basically became American patriots and anti-communists. Uh, and they had a little bit of sympathy towards markets. But Urban Crystal wrote a famous book called Two Cheers for Capitalism. And they gave it two cheers, right? Actually, they don't write for the Dispatch, Scott. Now they write for Commentary Magazine. Commentary Magazine is still the neocon magazine. Um, so. Uh, these are people who didn't care that much about uh, social issues. They, 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 they're, they're probably a bunch of them are atheists. Most of them are Jewish. Uh, they, again, uh, formed a coalition with the religious right. We'll get to them in a minute. But, but basically, they were secular. They were pro a lot of the left's social agenda. They were somewhat pro-capitalism a little bit, but they were really hardcore on... Um, foreign policy on, on pro-America, anti-communist, and bringing democracy to the world. That's one leg of the stool, if you will. Uh, no, Kissinger was not one of them. Another leg of the school, stool was, um, and this is, all, these are, this is what the conservative movement was, starting in the late 1950s on, uh, until I think uh, uh, 2016. The second leg of the stool was, uh, the, the social conservatives, the religious right, the people who, what they really cared about, what they really at the end of the day cared about was uh, religious tradition, making sure, you know, anti-abortion, uh, prayer in school, but also things like respect for the flag. Uh, these are not defenders of free speech. They would, they would be pro, uh, fine with laws against blasphemy. Uh, no, this isn't uh, Barry Goldwater at all. This is, this is more of the, um, uh, you know, of the evangelical right, of the moral majority, um, of uh, people like, um, I don't know, uh, Rick Santorum uh, and Mike Huckabee, although Rick Santorum and Mike Huckabee give, uh, a, a, again, much more on the 
capitalist side than, than let's say, uh, uh, the Pat Buchanans of the world who never liked capitalism, never liked capitalism, and was on the religious right. So you see, it's, so it's, it's complicated. So this is the family values, exactly, the family values crowd uh, and all of that. So you had, you had uh, that's uh, a third leg of the school, uh, stool, right? So you had the uh, neoconservatives, you had, oh, second leg of the stool. So you had the neoconservatives, uh, you have the religious right, uh, then you have the, what they call libertarians, right? The, 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 the ones who it really don't care about anything. What they really care is about free markets. They care about, about economic liberty, right? And, and that's the primary thing that they think is important. Jonathan, thank you. Really appreciate the support. That's what they think. And those are the three legs of the stool. All they care about is free markets. Now, all of them kind of gave lip service to the other people's agenda, right? The neocons gave lip service to the social conservatives. The social conservatives gave lip service to the pro-free markets. The pro-free markets gave lip service to the, to the neocons on foreign policy. And, they, and given that there was this big threat, the Soviet threat out there, they all kind of agreed to get along and, and, uh, and, and, and do their thing and, and not worry about it too much, right? National Security Wing is probably the neocons. National Security Wing would, would, would primarily be the neocons. Um, and then there was this other wing in the Republican Party, which you'd call the populist wing, which was kind of part of the conservative movement, but it was always a minority. It was always a, a small piece of it, never taken too seriously, uh, never really had a, a presidential candidate. Po call it the populist wing of the conservative movement. And that would be Pat Buchanan. And Pat Buchanan would be uh, the dominant voice there. Um, there were others, and that would be a real nativism, so an anti-neocon, uh, anti-interventionist, anti-bring uh, democracy to the world in any kind of sense. And, uh, uh, you know, build the walls, stop trade. So there's always been this element of this populism uh, within the Republican, within the Republican establishment, within within kind of the, the conservative movement, uh, this very uh, populist agenda. But it was not part of the three-legged stool. It was not part of what the core of conservatism was, and it, what, it was not what where most voters were. Most voters on the right were in one of those three positions, and um, and and. The, you know, that really dominate the discussion in the right for a very long time. And I think it's always been the case, for reasons I'll talk about in a little bit, that it's the, quote, libertarians that always garnered the least support among all these different groups. That there were more religious conservatives, more neocons, and more others than there were free market advocates, really people passionate about the free markets. The free markets was always tagged on. It was tagged on to foreign policy. It was tagged on to social conservatism. For almost nobody among in the conservative movement, and I go down back to Buckley, and, and maybe the exception here is Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater is the only representative, I think, of this free market side of the conservative movement that ever made it to the presidency and ran on that as an agenda. He still catered to the social conservatives. He still catered to the other elements, but mostly he was a free market guy. And remember what happened to Barry Goldwater in the election. So Barry Goldwater was the most free market presidential candidate I think the Republicans have ever had, certainly in the 20th century. Well, with the exception of Coolidge, right? What happened to Goldwater? He lost in a landslide. He lost in a landslide. There's just no support for that. And of course, Ronald Reagan learned from that. And even though Ronald Reagan's instinct might have been to run as kind of a Barry Goldwater, run on economic issues, run on economic liberty, he didn't. Some of, he, he did some. But a lot of what he ran on was he made sure the socially conservative stuff. Because it was the socially conservative element that made it possible for him really to win. It was the evangelicals flipping from 1976 to 1980, flipping from support of Jimmy Carter to support of Ronald Reagan that won 
the presidency for Reagan. Thatcher in the, in, in the UK is very different, uh, Tazy. UK has a very different dynamic than the United States. But, but even in the UK, you're seeing a real shift, right? You're seeing populism again rise up in the UK with a, a complete decline in, in economic freedom. And even Margaret Thatcher. Okay, so let's get to Margaret Thatcher because Margaret Thatcher is a good example as well. Actually, Margaret Thatcher is, is the same as what I'm saying. Margaret Thatcher ran, I think she won it first time in 1977. She basically ran an anti-left campaign. She ran against labor. And people had had it with labor. They were fed up with labor. And she spent the first administration, the first period uh, being prime minister, fighting and not getting much of her agenda done and being unbelievably unpopular. Until what? Until what? See, free markets are always unpopular or have been in the last 50 years unpopular. What got, what tipped it for Margaret Thatcher? What made Margaret Thatcher popular, so popular that she could get away with free market stuff? What tipped it was the Falkland War. People forget about the war between UK, the United Kingdom, and Argentina over a couple of dinky little islands off the coast of Argentina in the Atlantic Ocean, South Atlantic Ocean, um, that are British, that, they, that Argentina claimed and invaded, and uh, the, the, uh, the British Navy went there and whipped the Argentinians, and Margaret Thatcher's approval ratings went through the roof. And only then, only then, only when she established herself as a foreign policy hawk defending the British crown and defending the pride of the Brits, could she get away with her market reforms. Market reforms are incredibly unpopular and have been. Now, there's a brief period post-Thatcher and post-Reagan where it seemed like the world was shifting post-fall of the Berlin Wall where people were embracing market ideas and there seemed to be some energy around it, but nothing politically in the West really happened. It was all little things, incremental things, nothing really huge, right? But the fact is that the libertarian leg of the stool that held up, that, that defined conservatism was always the stepchild, was never the core was never what made them popular, was never what gave them political power. And therefore, it was the most neglected part. It was the one least talked about. And most importantly, and we'll, get, we'll keep returning to this, most importantly, it's the one that people are least passionate about. People are very passionate about their social ideas, pro or anti-abortion, pro or anti-religion, pro or anti-gay marriage. The social issues bring out a certain moral fire. People are very, very passionate about foreign policy, about foreign policy, about being patriotic and American identity, and, and the same thing, again, with, with, with Margaret Thatcher and beating, beating Argentina and the Falklands. But on the right, you get no, zero passion around economics. The passion around economics all comes from the left. Because on economics, the left has them all high ground and everybody knows it and the right is just trying to catch up. And the right is just talking economics. And the right is just showing the numbers. And the moral passion is just not there. And as a consequence, all the energy and the passion and the, and, the, and, the, and the real grassroots was all around the social conservatism, the, the Christian right, and the foreign policy stuff. And then the foreign policy stuff was completely destroyed by George W. Bush as disastrous wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And in a sense, the one leg of the stool went away because 
I mean, we're not going to bring democracy to the world. Nobody wants to do it anymore. It failed dramatically. Nobody has passion around that. What does America really stand for, given what it's done in the Middle East? And everybody just, you know, there's just, it's just not a political agenda. Nobody cares about it. You know, get out of everything. So with, with the failure of the Bush administration post 9-11, that leg of the stool almost went away. The neocons got completely discredited. The whole foreign policy establishment on the right got completely discredited. So now you've got two legs of the stool left. You've got the religious conservatives, and you've got the so-called free market libertarian wing. Financial crisis destroyed the free market libertarian wing. Republicans who used to believe in free markets suddenly accepted completely the rhetoric that the market has caused the financial crisis, that this is what happened when you give the market too much, that it was all about Wall Street greed, that Wall Street was anti-Main Street, that inequality was an issue, that inequality was a problem. And basically, the financial crisis destroyed and dissipated and, and reduced the strength and the ability to stand up and the ability to defend the free market wing. And that wing was always weak, was always weak, was never strong. They never had a moral defense of capitalism. At the end of the day, Goldwater's defense of capitalism was religion. But by the end of the Bush administration, there was nobody to defend capitalism. I mean, it was Bush and a Republican House and, that passed massive legislation to bail out banks and to do all this anti-capitalist stuff. And I mean, this is from the right. So it can't be. It can't be. Capitalism is good. Yeah, uh, Harold just says that he just listened to a David Fum on a podcast, and he completely blames the financial crisis and deregulation. Absolutely. I mean, they don't know what they're talking about. What deregulation? But that's what they blame it on. So uh, the financial crisis knocked out the second leg of the stool. And what happens when you have a stool with one leg? It falls down. And basically, the conservative movement was left with social conservatives, with religion, and nothing. And that's the void into which Donald Trump stepped in. He stepped into that void with a Pat Buchanan-like populism that appealed to the religious right, and of course he appealed explicitly to the religious right, and established, turned it into a boss stool, established one big foundation for it. The blue dogs are not Republicans. The blue dogs are Democrats. The blue dogs are centrists. They don't, the blue dogs are not conservatives. Wanda Freeman keeps asking about the blue dogs. Blue dogs are not conservatives. So they're not part of this, right? They are moderate Democrats and centrist Republicans who are kind of for limited, for smaller government, not limited government, for smaller government. They were Democrats, now they may be Republicans, but they're not conservatives. They don't consider themselves part of the conservative movement. So what you got in conservatism now is basically one stool with one leg. And that one leg combines religion, social conservatives, with nativism, with leftist economic policies. So free markets have been abandoned completely. And we get Pat Buchanan type economics, which is pro-industrial policy, pro-central planning, pro-programs to help the working class, pro-tariffs, pro-trade restrictions, 
pro walls, anti immigration of all kinds, complete disengagement from the world. And that's conservatism today. That's the national conservative movement. That's the new right. That's the post liberal right. You know, historically, liberal means pro liberty. Liberal meant pro individualism. Liberal meant we trust the individual to live his life as he sees fit. We just create order. We, we defend, protect his rights, and leave him alone. That's what liberal has always meant, classical liberal in today's world. And what the right today is, is anti liberal, post liberal, illiberal. Illiberal. And that's where the conservative movement is, and that's where the electorate is. That's where they all are. Now, I want to show you a graph. I'll show you. Let's see if I can find this. There we go. See this graph? Um, so this is a graph of the 2016 electorate. Um, in the past, in past elections, I don't have graphs to show this, but in past elections, if you so red is Republican, blue is Democrats, the, the x-axis, this axis, the x-axis goes from minus one, which is, I guess, complete statism, communism, complete control by the government, uh, all the way to plus one, which is complete laissez-faire, right, laissez-faire economics. And the y-axis is on social policy. So minus one is, I guess, um, everybody has to be transgender. I don't know. I, but complete, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, complete liberty uh, when it comes to social practices and plus one is the government dictates your gender, I guess, and uh, whether you, you can't get divorced even. Uh, divorce is illegal, and certainly abortion is illegal. So this is the social, Y is social, X is economic. And historically what you'd find is the upper left corner would have the fewest number. And the, 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 most of the dots are congregated around the upper right and the lower left. Democrats were the lower left, Republicans were the upper right, and some Democrats were in the upper left because uh, they were socially conservative in spite of being pretty socialist, so Rep Democrats were there. Uh, some Republicans were in the uh, lower right, so they might be, um, you know, socially liberal and pro-free markets in the, in the uh, lower right. That, that's historically. What you're seeing here is a complete emptying out of that bottom right corner, that pro-free market, that call it libertarian corner, and not just free market, but individualist corner. That is the idea of leaving individual free to both pursue their economic interest and their social interest. That corner, the corner where I consider myself to be, is empty. There's almost nobody there. And that the corner that has suddenly got super populated by both Democrats and Republicans is the authoritarian corner. It's the corner of we want to control you socially and we want to control you economically. Right. And that's the upper left-hand corner. And that is the political transition that's happened in the United States. It's emptied out the free market, emptied out voters in the free market corner and moving to the left. Um, I, I found this, I got this graph in an article by, um, by Patrick Deneen, who is a new right, uh, uh, illiberal, uh, really, really bad guy. But, um, you know, he's the lead, one of the leading intellectuals of the uh, anti-classical liberal view. Um, yeah, we, we've got some of them. Uh, Anoka, An Anoka says individualism is gay and cringe. <laughs> That's pretty gay, Anoka, whatever the hell that means. Um, notice individualism. Individualism. Individualism is bad in America. So... Uh, so he says, among his students, Patrick Deneen says, that traditionally, 
A third were progressives. A third were, uh, you know, Republican fusionists, upper right-hand corner. And a third were libertarian. And he started at Georgetown and Notre Dame at Princeton. He's at Notre Dame right now. And he says he probably got more kind of conservative students because he is known as a conservative, right? That's not called humor. That's called, so, so James says, boomers. It's called humor. No, that's not called humor. You, you young people have no concept what humor actually is. Um, so he says this year, he's got a third Republican fusionist, upper right. He's got a third progressives, lower left. And a third, what he's calling post-liberals, upper left. Anti-free markets, anti-social freedom, which is where he is. He says, and hardly a libertarian in the room. So that was a long introduction to the point that free market ideas are losing. The statists, the status of muscle and the status of soul are winning. The people who want to control both your mind and your body are winning. The people who want to control you in the bedroom and the boardroom are winning. Call them the new right, the new left, the, the, the whatever, the religious left, the religious right. They're the ones winning. Yeah, one of Freeman says, sounds like Russia today. Yes, and it's not an accident that these people adore Putin. They adore Orban. They adore those autocrats, authoritarians, who restrict their people's economic freedom and restrict their people's social freedom because that's the dream they have for America. Most of them happen to be Catholic, and they'd love to bring about some form of Catholic theocracy to us all, but they'll take whatever they can get. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to yourownbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Your Own Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.